All right, yeah, so my topic for tonight is a conservative rethinking of the French Revolution. You ask, why are rethinking? Well, the images that probably spring to mind from the French Revolution are of guillotines cutting off aristocratic heads in the midst of the political terror. And because of these acts of violence, the French Revolution has often been judged as a bad revolution contrasted with the American Revolution, which often gets portrayed as a solidly conservative conflict for the rights of Englishmen. Now, one of the questions that historians have tried to wrestle with here is, was the French Revolution condemned to end in disaster from its inception? Was the reign of terror a bug of circumstances or a feature of the revolutionaries' ideology? But often when people ask this question, there's an assumption that ideology is the chief guiding principle of human action, as though all of the events of history have their source in reasoned argumentation. Most historians today have come to appreciate, however, that the French Revolution, as with any historical event, was a mixture of ideology and circumstances, but this hasn't always trickled down into the popular narrative so much, which often tends to draw more from fictional works like A Tale of Two Cities than from actual historical reality. So tonight, I'd like to do three things. One is to provide a broad overview of the train of events around the French Revolution of 1789 so that we can have a proper historical context for it. And then from this, to demonstrate that there was nothing inevitable about the French Revolution. The readings and writings in the preceding years did not predetermine the events that unfolded in 1789. In other words, the revolution was unexpected and unplanned. And adding to that, then I'd like to conclude that contrary to Edmund Burke's famous work condemning the 1789 French Revolution, the revolutionaries were often reacting to circumstances all in a conservative attempt to maintain law and order in the midst of a quickly crumbling political infrastructure that they did not intend to overthrow. As one of the deputies to the French National Convention put it, a man does not begin as a revolutionary, he becomes one. So the French Revolution owes much of its origins to another revolution, the American Revolution. The French government had contributed an impressive amount of manpower and money to helping the Americans defeat the British. But when that conflict ended in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, the French monarchy, although victorious, was now bankrupt. The French king at the time, Louis XVI, working with his ministers, pushed for a budgetary reform, but was continually thwarted by various individuals who would have been negatively affected. In 1787, the king finally called together an assembly of notables comprised of the most important intellectuals from among France's nobility, and among them were many future revolutionaries, such as the Comte de Mirabeau and Marquis de Lafayette. King Louis hoped that the Assembly of Notables, while lacking any actual legislative power, might be able to convince the various French political bodies to accept the necessary increase in taxation to get the government out of bankruptcy. But this was no small task, as the French administrative government was a complicated, overlapping, and frequently just dysfunctional network of competing bureaucracies. The Assembly of Notables met, but much to Louise's frustration, rather than simply supporting his budgetary plans, they instead proposed more sweeping financial reforms and insisted that these should then be presented for approval to the representative body of the Estates General which was quite a change to how the monarchy had operated. As France's representative government at the time was in theory made up of three political classes known as the three estates, namely the clergy, the nobility, and then the people. But I say in theory because the king had not called a meeting of the three estates in over 175 years. Um, instead, the French monarchs have been busy peeling away all political power from the three estates and trying to centralize it within the monarchy. In compensation for this lack of political involvement, the clergy and nobility had been granted special taxing exemptions. And in the case of the Roman Catholic clergy, they also had the power to tax the populace for tithes. 
And while there was, there certainly was a, a caste system at work here, it wasn't as clear cut as these designations can make it sound. And for instance, uh, there, were, there were many gradations of aristocracy within the nobility, and not all the members recognized one another as members of the same status. Uh, that having been said, the nobility did generally see themselves as born to a higher station set apart from the rest of society. And this then was reflected in their taxing status and the seniorial dues that the peasants paid to the nobility in order to be allowed to live on their land. Now it was popular to imagine that it must have been, must have been these lower classes, the peasants, that rose up in revolution against the injustice of the French caste system. And after all, in 1788 and 89, there was, there was a little perfect storm of bad harvests and winters that left France's poorest begging for bread. Um, but but there, there are two things that stand out against this being the primary cause for the revolution. And one is that we find numerous famines, plagues, and bad harvests all throughout French history. And while many of them did lead to riots, there was only one revolution. The other point is that while bread riots did in fact play a role in the revolution, it was not France's most poverty stricken that would lead the revolution. Now, rather, it was France's growing middle class of the third estate, the people you would think most likely to support the existing institutions, wealthy merchants, bankers, businessmen, and lawyers who spearheaded the revolution. And this is, this is particularly striking because the French populace at the time was actually blissfully unaware of their government's financial straits. And over the last hundred years, France as a whole had actually been experiencing widespread economic growth. To quote historian Crane Britton, France in 1789 was a very striking example of a rich society with an impoverished government. And it's because of the lack of evidence for a Marxist style class conflict going on here that some historians over the years have attempted to argue that the motivating spark can be found within the revolutionary generation's readings and writings, whether that's the ideals of the Enlightenment, the political philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or the rise of Jansenist theology. The only problem with these claims is that we actually have a really good list of the books that were being bought and read at the time. And they're topically all over the place, um, even philosophically and politically contradictory. So trying to derive what people at the time believed from what they were reading, is, it's extremely complex as there simply isn't a single dominant philosophy running throughout all of this. And to those who want to blame Rousseau for everything, the Enlightenment philosophers made up only a very small proportion of pre-revolutionary reading. And in fact, the revolutionaries quoted the Roman orator Cicero 10 times more than Rousseau. And that brings us to one thing that the French revolutionaries did in fact have in common with one another and also with the American revolutionaries, their classical education. As part of their schooling, the members of the third estate were steeped in reading and translating the Latin classics. One Frenchman recalled, as soon as I began my studies, I was told stories of Romulus and his wolf, the capital and the Tiber. The names of Brutus and Cato and Scipio pursued me in my sleep. The letters of Cicero were piled into my memory and it was only several years later that I came to realize I was actually French and a resident of Paris. Uh, these classical references created a common vocabulary and a rhetoric for the revolutionaries to such an extent that members of the nobility would actually complain during the revolution that they were unable to compete with the education and oratory of the members of the third estate. Um, so after uh, over 100 years of political centralization, Louis was not about ready to compete with the three estates by calling a meeting of the estates general. However, things were rapidly spiraling out of his control. Over the next several years, various governmental bodies debated budgetary proposals and even came to blows over it while riots and brigands roamed across France over rising bread prices. And finally, Louis reluctantly summoned the Estates General. And on May 4th, 1789, 
representatives of all three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners, they paraded through Paris on their way to the Estates General in what was seen as a magnificent display of French unity and political optimism. However, expectation and reality quickly departed from one another. King Louis, in a move that would become a repeated failure of his over the next few years, he summoned the Estates General, but once assembled, he didn't lead the debates, he never gave them a specific issue to discuss, nor did he make it clear what political powers he was giving the Estates General. Left to their own devices, the deputies of the Third Estate believed that Louis had generously given them broad powers to debate the financial issues and propose whatever policies they deemed necessary. The three estates met in their individual halls, but they soon found themselves uh, locked in debate with one another over what their intended purpose was. But it soon became apparent that the third estate was by far the most eloquent and politically savvy of the three, and quickly began to dominate the proceedings, which frustrated both the nobility and the clergy, causing them then to reject all the proposed compromises. After several months of angry debate, the Third Estate became convinced that the only way forward was to propose a common meeting of all three estates. And if this was rejected by the other two, then the Third Estate would have to meet independently. And sure enough, when the Third Estate called for a common assembly, the clergy and the nobles refused to participate. After much debate, the commoners announced on June 17th that they were declaring themselves a sovereign national assembly and that all former taxes were illegal until a new fiscal system could be put in place. However, a few days later, a majority of the clergy, actually from the second estate, then voted to leave their hall and join the third estate in the national assembly. And this defection finally roused the king to act, and he announced that he would personally give a public statement before the three estates. But then on the morning of June 20th, the National Assembly was shocked to find themselves locked out of their hall, supposedly to prepare the room for, their, for the king's appearance. However, it was immediately perceived as a part of a uh, royal conspiracy to permanently shut down the National Assembly. So outraged, members of the deputies, they marched down the street to an indoor tennis court and there famously swore that they would never disband as an assembly until they had drafted a new constitution and fulfilled their obligations to the nation. The king in turn called a royal session and in front of all the estates declared the national assembly to be an illegitimate body and threatened to dissolve the assembly of the third estate if they did not conform to his demands. The king finished his speech and then ordered the deputies to empty the hall the members of the National Assembly holding to their oath refused to leave their seats. And in a shocking turn of events, several of the deputies gave rousing speeches declaring that the National Assembly was a lawful representative body of the nation and thus not even the king could legally disband them. Despite these rave words, most of the deputies were actually terrified that they had pushed things too far and they believed that the king was merely acting on the bad advice of a few ministers and could be reasoned with just given the chance. However, at this point, the National Assembly was meeting with widespread public approval, and on June 25th, a large contingent of the nobility now left their seats and joined with great fanfare the commoners and the dissident clergy in the National Assembly. The king now changed his position and ordered all the remaining deputies to join the combined assembly, although he insisted on continuing to refer to it as the Estates General rather than the National Assembly. Regardless, the deputies of the National Assembly, the city of Paris and the surrounding countryside turned out to celebrate the king's endorsement. And for the first time, people began to use the term revolution here to describe this recent political victory. The National Assembly had bravely stood up for the good of the nation and Louis, as a just and honorable king, had put aside political squabbling in order to unite the three estates. It was believed that once the deputies had returned from their celebratory adjournment, they would then set about drafting a new constitution to provide a more stable national government. But in reality, the king was only playing for time. And people soon grew alarmed as over the next week, thousands of German and Swiss mercenaries began assembling outside of Paris. 
And when the king dismissed his most liberal members of the royal council, people panicked that he was planning a violent assault on Paris and the National Assembly in a St. Bartholomew-style massacre. Parisians armed themselves and threw up barricades, leading to clashes with royal troops, many of whom then mutinied and joined the people. The king's officials found themselves unable to control the chaos, and so the city leaders replaced them with an electoral assembly, and they formed a national guard militia to protect the city, picking Lafayette to lead it. And then on the morning of July 14th, a semi-organized crowd of Parisians attempted to negotiate from arms and munitions from the military fortress of the Bastille on the eastern edge of the city. The negotiations between the nervous soldiers and people lasted on into the afternoon, but when a miscommunication led the people to believe that they'd been invited into the fortress, the soldiers freaked out and opened fire on the crowd. The Parisians were outraged and believed that they'd been purposefully lured into an ambush by the soldiers. They assaulted the fortress with the assistance of some of the city's soldiers who brought up an artillery piece and forced the garrison to surrender. Several former city leaders and members of the garrison, including the Bastille commander, were then executed in revenge killings. And then at this point now, the, the king and the National Assembly become concerned that they were powerless to control the situation. And the king realized that he had lost the loyalty of his royal troops, and next morning after the fall of the Bastille, he personally appeared before the National Assembly. He declared his support for them and agreed to work with them to save the nation. The remaining recalcitrant nobles also joined the National Assembly now, and when two days later Louis rode into Paris, he was met with thunderous applause. Meanwhile, however, the rest of France had heard the news of the violence in Paris and the administrative bureaucracy's inability to instill order, and a mass panic took hold of the nation that they were about to be engulfed in violence in what's come to be known as the Great Fear. Realizing that there was no longer any central authority and that they were now actually functionally on their own, municipal departments all over the country began independently reorganizing their administrative governments, drawing from leading members of all three estates. And while these then swore allegiance to the new National Assembly, in practice they actually ended up functioning more as um, independent city-states. The next few months, the National Assembly desperately debated how to instill a sense of national unification and bring about an end to the chaos. On August 4th, the debates took a shocking turn, though, when a few of the liberal nobles stood forward and declared before the Assembly that as a gesture of generosity, they would renounce the seniorial dues owed to them by the peasantry. Taken up in the moment, other nobles also began to renounce additional legal privileges granted to them until the National Assembly became a whirlwind of all the deputies, nobles, clergy, and commoners, radicals, and conservatives, dismantling the old institutions, privileges, and taxes for a national one built on equal rights of citizenship. And by the end of the day, the deputies had enthusiastically drawn up and accepted 16 articles of renunciation of class privileges in favor of a common system of equal taxation. People everywhere were amazed by the nobility's actions. One journalist wrote, the exhilaration of joy spread quickly to every heart. We congratulated one another, and in our enthusiasm, we christened our deputies the fathers of the country. It seemed as though a new day was breaking over France. Everywhere there were feelings of fraternity, sweet fraternity. The National Assembly now finally set about drafting a constitution, one that would solidify the new equality of citizenship and that would bring the now semi-autonomous municipalities back under a central authority. After a week of intense debate, they presented the nation with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizens. As the first part of the new constitution, it formulated a single set of natural rights for all men in life, liberty, and property. Um, and one side note, 
and I think is relevant to this audience, is that the Constitution now also extended equal rights to Protestants, something that had been denied to them basically since the Edict of Nantes had been revoked over 100 years earlier. And so we find actually Protestant ministers in important positions throughout the revolutionary leadership. But even as the country embraced these new political changes, the king remained a looming concern. The deputies were now debating how much power the king should have in the new constitutional monarchy, but there continued to be rumors that Louis was still working to undermine the new government. And despite having endorsed the National Assembly after the fall of the Bastille, Louis had never given any public support for either the August 4th Decrees, or the Declaration of Rights. And then on October 5th, the Parisian mob again took action. Marching to Versailles, a crowd of several hundred women barged into the National Assembly, demanding an increase in the supply of bread and threatening the Monarchian deputies. After discussing their plight with the Assembly, they then marched to see the king at the palace. Louis met them, agreed to hear their demands, but the following day, the mob became unruly and broke into the palace, killing several of the guards in the resulting fight. And although they never had any clear intentions, Louis was terrified what the mob might have done had they captured his family. And so he made a public announcement that he would do everything he could to increase the bread supply. He accepted all the August decrees as well as the new constitution, and he promised to move from the Palace at Versailles to the Tuileries Palace in Paris as an act of solidarity with the people. The next week, the National Assembly followed his example and joined him in Paris. There, over the next several months, the Assembly drafted plans for the essential administrative government to replace the municipal ones. Finally completed in February of 1790, they held widespread democratic elections over the entire country and formally established the new national government. In that same month, Louis appeared once more before the National Assembly and announced his own personal support for the constitutional monarchy and urged national unity. Everywhere, the news was received with widespread enthusiasm. In one church, the parish priest read the king's speech at the pulpit, and the whole congregation broke into applause and shouts of, long live the king. The revolution was over. France was flooded with a sense of optimism and excitement for what was yet to come. They'd managed to transition from a near absolute monarchy to a constitutional one with a shocking lack of violence, especially when compared to the revolutions in England and America. Liberals and conservatives in both these countries praised French restraint. Lafayette eagerly sent George Washington the key to the Bastille in celebration, and Washington wrote him a letter congratulating him on the revolution's success and warmly thanking him for the gift. You actually go see the key now at uh, Mount Vernon. But there was one notable exception to all of this praise, Edmund Burke. Burke, a member of the English Parliament, surprised everyone when he came out as a vocal opponent of the French Revolution. And this was particularly surprising because he was a staunch defender of the English constitutional monarchy and the English Bill of Rights, and he even defended the American Revolution. So why did he now condemn the French when they were seemingly just following the English and American example? And I, I purposefully chose to end the narrative tonight here in the spring of 1790, because it was at this point that Burke denounced the revolution as a quote unquote digest of anarchy. Burke explained to one confused individual that his support for the English constitutional monarchy and his criticism of the French was not intended to be a statement about political systems in the abstract. He was not interested in what political system is theoretically, universally right or wrong, but in what specific system is necessary for each particular society. Because, quote, government is not made in virtue of natural rights, unquote. Government is an equal party to the social contract, not with individuals, but with the whole of society, and thus society has no right to unilaterally change the terms of that contract or remake the government regardless of how it stands on individual rights. 
The whole point of government, according to Burke, is that it does not emerge from within society to protect individual rights. Rather, government sits apart from the whims of society, providing it with civilizing restrictions established through generations of tradition. Quote, society requires not only that the passions of individuals should be subjected, but that even in the mass and body, the inclinations of men should frequently be thwarted, their will controlled, and their passions brought into subjection. This can only be done by a power out of themselves and not in the exercise of its function, subject to that will and to those passions which it is its office to bridle and subdue. In this sense, the restraints on men as well as their liberties are to be reckoned among their rights. But as the liberties and the restriction vary with times and circumstances and admit to infinite modifications, they cannot be settled upon any abstract rule and nothing is so foolish as to discuss them upon that principle." Unquote. Burke claimed that the French feudal system and its absolute monarchy had through hundreds of years of customs imposed upon France an ennobling restraint. Law can never rule solely on its own merit. Rather, it requires that it be combined with a popular sentiment of national love for that government. But the revolution had undone all that. Burke cries out, all the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society, which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity, are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. Now, even if we accept Burke's conservative criticism as philosophically correct, and we join with him in lamenting the collapse of the French Ancien Regime, this does not require us to condemn the motivations or necessarily even the actions taken by the revolutionaries. We could debate whether or not the revolutionaries followed the wisest course of action, but they did not cause the political status quo to collapse. It did that on its own. Their attempt to build a new political hierarchy was a response to the chaos caused by the old societal norms having dismantled themselves or because they had already been made irrelevant. And the revolutionaries replaced the old defunct government not as a mere mob of society, but as they believed a legal body of that government. And the supposed abstract rights of the new French constitution that Burke lambasts were an attempt by the revolutionaries not to create a new world, although this is definitely how they sold it, but rather it was an attempt to reflect the rights that were already being established in France as a political reality. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, the French Revolution is often condemned based on the supposed ideological beliefs that drove the revolutionaries. But there was not a single unified ideology that formed a revolutionary worldview and somehow made the revolution inevitable. In the years prior to the revolution, these future leaders of the revolution would not have predicted or even supported overthrowing the feudal system of France or imposing a constitutional monarchy. And furthermore, revolutions are created not just by those who lead them, but also by those who oppose them. And in this case, that was particularly true because of the actions of King Louis XVI. Revolutions never end where they were intended to, because no one side is ever solely in control. So in this conservative rethinking of the revolution, I'm not defending the revolution so much as asking that we rethink how we see and understand motivations and causality. If we're simply looking at ideology and motivations to judge a revolution as good or bad, then the 1789 French Revolution is not as dissimilar from the American Revolution as we often like to think. And perhaps the real difference was in their particular circumstances and their response to those. 
It was only years after the 1789 revolution that the leaders of the new regime in an attempt to make sense of the past tried to then go back and impose a consistent policy and a coherent ideology over the events of the past decade. Now, and this isn't to say that ideology is nothing, but in some circles, we tend to think that worldview governs all. If we just get our intellectual ducks in a row, then we can do no wrong. But any proper study of history quickly reveals to us that we need to take a much humbler approach and realize that circumstances beyond our control might pave the road to hell with our good ideology. And therefore, ideological gatekeeping is insufficient. Worldviews provide us with guiding principles that serve as a frame of reference, but they don't give us an interpretive manual for how to apply them to particular situations. And when the tides of history get rolling, unfortunately, we might just find ourselves along for the ride asking, where are we going and why are we in this handbasket? <laughs> but that is a topic for another day on the French Revolution of 1793. So thank you.